Kenya is set to make history later this week when Chief Justice Martha Kume takes the oath of office as the country's Chief Justice. She will become the first woman to hold the position. President Uhuru Kenyatta on Wednesday appointed to Justice Kume to head the judiciary as well as President of the Supreme Court. Her appointment follows the approval of Parliament two weeks after she trounced nine other candidates for the job. Kume will head the judiciary for a non-renewable ten-year term. All that now remains is her swearing in. The Kenyan Parliament on Wednesday morning approved her appointment in a unanimous decision by the country's judicial Services Commission. The, she replaces Justice David Maracha, who retired in January this year. Under Justice Maracha, the Kenyan Supreme Court grabbed the headlines in 2017 after a historic ruling in which the court nullified the re election of President Tuhuru Kenyatta, signaling a judicial independence in that country. The ruling, however, irked Kenyatta, who vowed to revisit the decision. This led to bad blood between the executive and the judiciary for the better part of Kenyatta's second presidential term as well as the remainder of Maracha's term in office. Well, we are now joined live by Elsie Saina, who is the Executive Director of the International Commission of Jurists based in Kenya. Elsie, good evening and welcome to the show. First of all, what does this appointment signal for people in Kenya? Good evening to you and thank you very much uh, for having the ICJ on the show this evening. Um, this appointment signals for the people of Kenya a lot of inspiration and hope, particularly for the women of Kenya that indeed they can rise to the very tops of the leadership and decision making. So it is an inspiration, but also it is celebrated widely because Justice Lady Martha Kome's journey to in the judiciary has been one that has been closely monitored and watched by many, uh, particularly the women movement in Kenya. Mm -hmm. I read somewhere as well that her appointment also means that um, the, the country has now been able to fulfill the constitutional obligation to have um, at least one third of um, the Supreme Court being women. That's right, yes. Our article, our constitutional under Article 27 provides that any elective or appointment position must reflect two-thirds gender principle and it is indeed um, a celebration and compliance and fulfillment of our constitutional principle on what we call the gender equality principle. In, as a matter of fact, um, once she takes the oath of office, Lady Justice will not only be the first woman Chief Justice in Kenya, but also her deputy is a woman. So we've gone beyond the two, the actually the one third gender principle in our constitution. So we're quite excited that it has come alive for an elective position of such high magnitude, which is the third arm of government, the judiciary of Kenya. Mm -hmm. And considering how long she's been in the legal space, even looking at back at when she started her own firm, um, what do you think she brings um, to the legal fraternity? And more especially looking at the Supreme Court. Thank you. Uh, Lady Justice, in our view, as ICJ Kenya, will bring uh, certainly one of the, the criteria that was being observed during the interview process was her professional capacity, her professional competence, and many years of experience in the judiciary. She has served as a High Court judge for many years and was elevated to the Court of Appeal because of her increased and depth and knowledge on jurisprudence on the rights of women and children. She's also championed a lot of leader. She's been in leadership positions, including one of the, the Kenya Magistrates and Judges Associations where she served as a chairperson. So she brings not only a judicial philosophy that looks at human rights and human rights lens, but also provides, you know, uh, provides a very deep, uh, deeply well thought out judicial and philosophical mind. Mm -hmm. So on one end, while you have this uh, celebration of uh, the country's first um, female chief justice, there's also the controversy on the other end, and you are one of those people who have been following the interviews through the, through the JSC. For instance, one of um, the top lawyers, Fred Ngatia, I think it is, I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounce his surname, um, he's saying that the scores have been manipulated. What's your understanding around the, the process of the JSC, and number two, the issue around the scoring? Uh, 
first of all, in terms of process of the interview, um, as ICJ Kenya, we were independent monitors of the process, and we were we asked the Judicial Service Commission to formally do this because as per law, they are required to ensure that public participation is part of their process, which they did televised live. So a lot of Kenyans were engaged online and the interviews were actually uh, broadcasted live. And this is not the first time it has happened, but it's a practice that uh, we have adopted in Kenya, particularly by the G Judicial Service Commission, to ensure that judicial appointments such as for Chief Justice, Supreme Court judges are televised live so that members of the public can participate. So in terms of process, uh, it, it was it was across the board for all the candidates that, sat, that appeared before the JSC. In terms of the deliberations and the concerns by um, one of the candidates being a uh, senior counsel friend Gatia. Yes, that is uh, one of the issues that concerns in terms of the decision making process. Uh, we, in our in our submissions to the JSC, we ask them that if they should make public the the uh, decisions they arrived of the final outcomes of the decisions that they selected the best candidate. And this is because under our constitution, a Kenyan, any Kenyan under Article 35 uh, provides for the right to access information with respect to decision making. What we know and we looked at the experience in South Africa is that um, the courts have said we are asked the details of the, the individual, core, the individual uh, scoring or, you know, the decision scoring is not necessarily uh, open to the public to protect the candidates. But the Judicial Service Commission must, um, should at least arrive at, should at least disclose how they arrived at a particular candidate. And rightfully so. So even the request for that uh, information uh, has been placed before the JSC for has been placed by Fred Gatia and any other Kenyan for that matter could also request for that information under the, the constitution. What, what's your understanding then of the purpose of having access to this information considering that um, uh, Fred Gatia is arguing that the process has been manipulated. Is there any, um, I don't know, legal avenue that would be made available to him if indeed he is satisfied that the process has been manipulated to challenge the appointment of of, um, Lady Justice? Yes, it is possible to uh, request that either directly writing to the JSC. Uh, if that does not come through, then you, are, you have the option to go to court and request that the JSC is compelled to disclose that information. That is an option that is open, not only to, to uh, senior counsel, but any other candidate that we in interested in knowing, or any other citizen. So there's the legal uh, avenue that is that is also available, because then it means that you're exercising your right to know. And this is not the first time that this kind of request could potentially be, be, be asked, but also previously we've had other candidates also file uh, cases before the court requesting disclosure of mm -hmm. you know the outcomes of the interview process so it's nothing new in Kenya it's for an individual citizen to exercise that right to request that information do you think that the appointment of lady justice and not for instance senior counsel Ngatia has averted a potential crisis considering that Ngatia represented the president during um, that challenge around um, the 2017 elections in front of the Supreme Court. And I'm asking this also on the basis of what we've seen happen in Uganda, for instance, where you have the Chief Justice who represented the president in the previous other case in relation to a dispute over the elections. It in our view as ICJ, we see that the, uh, the selection, the appointment of Lady Justice was purely on merit and because of her performance during the interview process. So it is about the, 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 the criteria and who was seen as the best candidate in that, in that uh, particular time. In this case, the JSC uh, and the President, including the Parliament this evening, have approved her appointment and she's actually been gazetted. So it's really about merit who was the best uh, candidate for the particular uh, circumstances mm -hmm. in Kenya at the moment. She also comes in during a very difficult time for the country with the president um, who wants to make amendments to the, to the constitution. And now we also heard from the high court in, in Kenya, for instance, saying that the constitutional amendment bill um, is an initiative of the president and the law is clear that the president does not have the constitutional mandate to initiate the constitutional changes through a popular initiative. Um, this 
this judgment number one asserts the independence of the judiciary however though it also comes at a time that you have a new justice that walks into um, the space and chances of this particular matter going all the way up to the Supreme Court mm -hmm. that's right yes the decision is is one of those that um, a lot of civil society organizations including the petitioners have been had been looking forward to uh, and and yes we foresee that it's a tight shot that the incoming chief justice will have to walk but presently um the because the decisions was rendered at the high court it has to go through the the, the, the processes of either you know being completely exhausted and articulated at the court of appeal and failing that uh, the respondent or applicant can actually have the avenue to go to the supreme court so we are waiting to see that as icj kenyan civil society but generally uh, from those who are opposed to the BBI, the Building Bridges Initiative, uh, they are very, they are lauding and welcoming the decision of the High Court mm -hmm. that demonstrates an assertion of judicial independence in terms of decisional independence, but also um, taking into account questions around public participation and co what the process of constitutional amendment ought to look like as per the Constitution of Kenya. Okay, and just a final one, considering that she walks into that space um, as in, in the Supreme Court, of course, um, taking over from a justice, a former Chief Justice David, David Maraja, would you say that she comes into the space knowing as well that there are the pillars of strength, for instance, looking at the independence that the judiciary was able to display back in 2017? Absolutely, yes. Uh, uh, during her interview, Lady Justice, uh, um, Martha Comer displayed that she was very much aware of what she was walking into both as the president of the Supreme Court but also as the leader of the judiciary. She's very aware of the challenges that are that she has to face, including questions of judicial funding. She'll need the resources to ensure that access to justice for, for the poor and the marginalized, which is the very is is a priority not only for the judge at a personal level but also something she said in her interview you will during her interview process she was one of the candidates the only candidate that came with a vision of what she had for the judiciary which made her stand out uh, as as actually a candidate who has mm -hmm. internalized her role so I would argue that, yes, she's very much aware of what she's walking into, not only given the potential uh, political contestation coming up in 2022, but also the need to ensure that the Supreme Court in, in Kenya is seen to, uh, to attain the vision it desired, which is homegrown African jurisprudence. Elsie Saina, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate that. Uh, we're going to go to a quick ad break. When we come back, we'll be in conversation with the Minister of Trade of Eswatini as they've raised concerns around uh, some of the truck drivers from Eswatini being attacked here in South Africa.